Welcome, all of you, to the first day of We Make the City Festival, which started today and will go on until Sunday. Uh, today and tomorrow is like the professional programs, and then on Saturday and Sunday we have more public uh, events. Um, today we will be talking about the architecture of connection. First we called it the architecture of loneliness, but that didn't sound that right, so we decided to focus on the positive end of loneliness and connection. And uh, we are doing it as, a, as a, co a, co a cooperative of architecture journalists from all over Europe. It's called A10, New European Architecture. And uh, it started out as a magazine somewhere in 2004. And two years ago, we continued the, uh, the, the, the magazine as, a, as an online platform. And now we have about 30 journalists that are connected to the platform and that report from the various city in, in Europe. And what we try to do is to uh, report equally from Western Europe as from Eastern Europe. And Western Europe, of course, is usually quite well uh, um, um, uh, broadcasted in, in all sorts of media. But Eastern Europe is usually a bit more difficult. So uh, um, that's one of the things that's really important. And that's also something that we will be um, uh, looking at today. We have a, a, a beautiful lineup, actually, and um, um, uh, three of them are connected to the A10 platform, and the, the fourth one, uh, or the, 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 the two of them are very, very close, collaborated, and dear friends, Stephanie and Peter. I will introduce them later. Um, loneliness uh, is actually quite an, uh, an actual uh, topic at the moment, and uh, it's also um, gaining more and more. Uh, acknowledgement that loneliness as such in a human life is actually could be the cause of all sorts of of course mental but also physical problems so um, we have uh, all sorts of programs not only in the Netherlands but also in other countries that try to deal with this uh, phenomenon and um, we tried to get the Minister of Loneliness from the UK today here which actually is a, a fantastic thing, of course, to have a, a minister of loneliness. But she couldn't make it because there are so many lonely people in the UK that she's very, very busy. So she excused herself. But um, uh, uh, to expand a bit, uh, extend a bit more on the on the on the topic of loneliness, I would like to invite Anna Yudina to the stage, who is actually the curator of this evening. And uh, Anna, a warm applause for Anna. Our cooperative member from France. Uh, you will be presenting a uh, project from France later, but could you please, it's on, could you please come? Uh, yeah, let's take the couch. <laughs> could you explain a bit more about why you think loneliness or connection at the moment is such an interesting topic to talk about? Uh, you know, if we uh, like begin from the beginning, it's already uh, quite common knowledge that uh, loneliness is recognized as almost a worldwide epidemic. It definitely uh, has those devastating effects which are being compared to, 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 to smoking and drinking and neglecting your health otherwise. Uh, but uh, there are, I say, there are very different reasons behind this loneliness. And it's not actually affecting, sometimes it's considered as the, the old people's problem, but it is not. There is a big problem of loneliness within the younger generation. And it doesn't really have uh, limits in terms of age or social standing. Uh, there are tons of different uh, reasons behind that. There can be problems of uh, social exclusion, economic isolation. There can be those problems of us being exposed to such incredible amount of digital connectivity and still trying to master the combination of this being connected to the entire world and at the same time being physically disconnected from lots of like people who are kind of nearby. Uh, on the other hand, what I think is important to deal with in our specific context is uh, the way uh, architecture and design, which are our primary topics, can deal with this loneliness. And then it's uh, interesting to analyze actually what, what, what is behind. Lo loneliness is a sensation, it's an emotional feeling. But what are the reasons behind it? It's this 
for instance, urban disconnect, it's the sense of isolation. And if we start breaking it down, if we start seeing specific examples, then this problem doesn't look uh, that overwhelming and doesn't look like something we cannot really deal with. But as long as we start breaking down, as long as we start seeing individual cases, we can see the ways for architects and designers, like architects specifically in our case, to find, to take initiative and to find ways to deal with this through the means of their profession and through their unique position in the society as those that are extremely sensitive antennas who can feel the interests of different groups of people and, uh, and, and connect them through their work and actually embody them and find an embodied solution. So which is actually our topic today. Thank you. So we will be looking further into examples. Did I answer the question? <laughs> sort of, sort of, <laughs> why we are here today. Yeah, you perfectly answered that question. So we will be looking into uh, the situation in Greece, in the Netherlands, in um, uh, Eastern Europe, in a more broader sense. And uh, you are actually from France. You will be presenting two cases yourself after yes. the, 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 the pre presentation that will be coming up. But could you explain uh, a bit more on, on, on how loneliness manifests itself within the French context of your projects? Maybe I won't say that there are like specific cases which are probably foreign to other Western European nations, but uh, maybe I'll, 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 um, I'll go through some of those in my presentation because uh, unlike the others who are focused on very specific projects they were involved in, my will be an overview of the different facets of uh, urban disconnect, of this, I, I prefer to call it <coughs> disconnect rather than loneliness, and how the different, there are, how there are different ways on different levels of reconnecting people through uh, architectural projects or other projects initiated by architects, I'd say it like that. Okay, mm. to illustrate this rather um, uh, abstract point of loneliness, disconnectedness, we have invited um, two um, uh, yeah, artist designers, uh, which would probably be the word. One is an architect and the other one is a photographer. And architect as well. And architect mm -hmm. as well. And they are both um, uh, Turkish by origin, and um, but now based in London, in, uh, in, in the UK. And they have made a, um, a, f uh, a photo series of how uh, uh, loneliness or disconnectedness, as Anna um, uh, phrases it, uh, manifests itself in London and in Istanbul. And I think it would be nice to have a look at the images and see what sorts of disconnectedness we can actually discover. Yeah, and probably how they manifest differently in those different cultures, or similarly in those different cultures we will see. And this will be the immersive part of our evening. Yeah. So we will stop talking and we will just be watching. If anybody, yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
So this series of images actually quite describes already uh, the different perceptions. We, 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 we were talking about loneliness or disconnection, but maybe it's solitude or looking for silence or... And even enjoying it. Yeah. <laughs> do we think all these people are lonely, actually? What, what, what was your impression when looking at these images? Yeah, and, 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 and also because we have been looking through a, a, an architect and a photographer's eye uh, and also the comments on these images, um, there is a relation between the places where they are, if it's near the seaside or in parks, etc. And I think um, um, these are uh, um, the, the elements or the, the tools of, of designers to actually work with when kind of moderating all these sequences between loneliness and Despite. maybe looking for silence or solitude. Yeah. So, uh, Anna, would you be um, uh, ready to present your cases in France? And maybe from there, reflect also on the images that we saw. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Anna. So, as Indira has just said, I will be talking about uh, French projects and about the different facets of urban disconnect and how it is being dealt through uh, or how it's being overcome through these projects. Uh, so, uh, actually, there will be uh, three main axes uh, living together, uh, doing together and uh, getting together. So let's start with the living together examples through uh, several projects by um, uh, architect Sophie Delay, uh, one of her, who, who, who is dealing quite a lot with uh, um, creating, creating new uses through her architectural projects and who asks a lot of questions related to Finding, finding the ways to better connect people, connect different generations, uh, connect the neighbors within larger residential blocks uh, through some uh, intelligent uh, design solutions. So this was a realized project in the city of Lille, uh, a social housing project called Machu Picchu. And as she explained, uh, she was really lucky uh, when uh, that uh, the that was a competition project, that there was an oral part of the competition because before uh, getting to that point, her project actually sat at the bottom of the jury's list. Uh, what she actually did for this um, project is <coughs> creating this sequence of openings throughout the block, which uh, mm, created this smooth transitional socializing route, which of course is doubled up by, by a fast track uh, elevator. But this created places for the people who inhabited the house to socialize, to have uh, open air uh, playgrounds for ki kids, to have differently shaped uh, spaces transversally, transversally designed. Uh, and adapted for different kinds of uses. One could be uh, very good for organizing like semi-outdoor, for instance, Tai Chi classes. Another was structured so that it could become a small art gallery. Yet another one could be uh, an open air cinema during the summer. The landlord's dream was to have in a few years Sunday market which would occupy all those, all this diagonal se sequence throughout the buildings, and actually the um, the client, the uh, social housing agency, has uh, been relieved to find finally this kind of project on the market because they have been experiencing this as a major problem of people being confined to their apartments in those social housing blocks and not really knowing where to, where, where to go from there. Well, this project really provided uh, ample, 
ample possibilities for them. And there is also those um, uh, outdoor uh, concours, the, 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 the running balconies that connected all the apartments and provided additional space for getting together and socializing. Other examples of the, work of the work of the same architect also dealing with different ways of connecting people in her residential projects are those with the questions being asked, will a smart floor plan help neighbors in getting to know each other? Or what can an architect do to facilitate the coexistence of different generations within uh, one home? Or uh, can a housing project reconcile personal and collective needs? This, for instance, is being answered in this competition project for 35 housing units for Bordeaux, where um, she has those shared balconies that connect several apartments, and the kitchen, which is the most, let's say, social zone of each apartment, is f faces this area. So there is this possibility of connection. And there is this little clever detail Part of the kitchen table flaps outside, so people can occupy both sides, partly outdoor, partly indoors. Then there is this, uh, once you go inside the apartment, there is this um, inside patio shared uh, between also several neighbors, which is semi-private, semi uh, semi-shared, communal shared. So it also creates the subtle opportunities to, to communicate without being without being forced to do so. Uh, or an, another project uh, that was rather a study she was uh, working on for one of the um, uh, uh, housing development uh, uh, companies was the idea of an intergenerational housing study, again for the city of Lille, from where she comes from. Uh, so what she decided to do was to combine uh, different kinds of apartments uh, for senior citizens, for families, for students, they are marked with different colors, and also shared spaces. And all of, the, uh, all of those give onto a shared atrium with uh, many different communal activities, which can be pursued by different generations. And in this case, they kind of mingle and they see each other, and there is this possibility of, of connecting through uh, the... Mm, uh, design idea which she proposes. Uh, another project uh, which also gives those possibilities to here rather overcome isolation uh, through design was one of the winning projects in the uh, Reinventing Paris competition. I don't know, do, do you know something about this competition? I, I, I guess yes. Oh. <laughs> Uh, so, very shortly, there was um, this big initiative from the municipality of Paris who has uh, developed a specific mechanism which would foster uh, innovative urban and architectural projects for specific locations in Paris and, importantly, make it possible for implementation. So, one of the winning projects uh, and one important moment in this uh, organizational part of this competition that the competing teams consisted well much much larger and much more uh, ample than a normal competing team. They had, of course, architects, developments, developers, investors, but also the people, the specialists who could ensure that the innovation is being proposed is consistent and feasible. So there were startups, there were experts in different domains. Uh, in, this, uh, in this particular case, the team consisted of um, a um, quite unique private school uh, which provides free tuition, which is now functioning in, 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 was launched in France but will also function in Silicon Valley. Free tuitions to young people who want to study web development. They have this opportunity to study it in Paris, but even if you have free tuition, it's really unaffordable for a young person to, uh, it's hardly affordable, let's say, to, to, to rent an apartment in Paris and student accommodations are not enough yet. So the solution was to um, create this uh, kind of capsule hotel uh, at, a very, at a very moderate rate, which would be affordable for those guys and which made, made them possible to overcome this isolation and come and study in Paris and get together. 
And also importantly, another uh, aim of this project was to connect those young people with the residents of the um, with the local residents and provide some uh, some shared services like both the students and the uh, the local people of a lower income have access to a, 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 a grocery store that provides uh, affordable food for both yes. and of course they have uh, a few shared spaces within this project uh, shared communal spaces that have an opportunity to bring together students and local associations. In terms of doing together, there is um, one very interesting project by uh, architect Lina Gottme and again a large group of other participants, uh, specialists in different aspects of food production uh, on all different stages of this cycle. Um, which has been, uh, it's another winning project of uh, Reinventing Paris. And this is the, actually the, um, uh, the project that, uh, that reuses, uh, repurposes an abandoned uh, train station within Paris, turning it into a project which is focused on, as I've just said, all aspects of uh, producing food. Uh, from actual production, because it integrates some urban farming, to various aspects of food culture, to cooking food, to consuming food together. So the story is uh, both about conviviality, of bringing in the, the local communities, of sharing the different uh, kitchens, because Paris is definitely a very multinational space, but also inviting here researchers, chefs, artists and media who will all have, have, have their, their place in this area. You have resident chefs, but you also have art exhibitions. Uh, you have this uh, uh, store where fresh produce produced here is being sold. You have those workshops. So this is a way of reconnecting people through one of the unfailing tools, mediums, uh, which, which is food. Um, yet another Reinventing Paris winner, which is about uh, bringing back people who suffer from social isolation, is the railway farm in another part of Paris, uh, on, the abandoned, on one of the segments of the abandoned uh, circular railways. It's called the railway farm, developed by architect Clara Sime, again with a large group of uh, other partners, which are specialists in other aspects. Uh, the idea is uh, not simply to bring urban farming within the city, but use urban farming as a way to reintegrate the lowest income residents by teaching them, by giving them a profession which will be also in demand for the city. So it's kind of a mutually beneficial uh, project. And it also, for the, for the citizens, it highlights the value of agricultural work. There were actually quite a lot of projects uh, in the Reinventing Paris uh, competition, a lot of other proposals which dealt with uh, urban agriculture, with uh, connecting tourists and local residents based on urban agricultural tourism, which sounds exotic, but could be, could be an option. Um, there, there, there was also, uh, well, let's say if you have a chance to visit uh, the, Venice, the ongoing Venice Architectural Biennale. I'd strongly recommend you to visit, and, and interested in the topic of overcoming the urban disconnect, I strongly recommend you to visit uh, the French Pavilion, which presents quite a lot of those third places, uh, places that emerged from, from a communal effort of various citizens. One of them, uh, I, I speak just about two of them, and I'm wrapping up. Uh, both of them by, uh, organized by the Initiative of Architects. This one is a Hotel Pasteur, a historic building which has been empty in the city of Rennes and which has been converted into a non-stop sequence of citizens' uh, initiated activities. Uh, the space is provided free of charge. This is some of the statistics which uh, can be given about this place 
which is on since 2013. Uh, and the other project initiated by the architect Julian Belair in the French suburb of Saint-Denis in an, in an old, uh, uh, in, in a dysfunctional office building. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the picture, but there is some statistics. If that the previous place was about non-stop citizen initiatives within the abandoned building, this one is about bringing together architects, musicians, uh, graphic designers, and all sorts of creative, um, creative individuals who were looking for the space where to work, and turning this, uh, you know, creative squad into a reference place in, in the Parisian area. And I'm finishing with uh, getting together with uh, two major projects. One is the transformation of the Place de la République, which is one of the main squares of Paris, and which, thanks to this transformation by TVK architects, has become the greatest, the, the, the biggest pedestrian squares in Paris. The statistics before, two-thirds traffic, one-third pedestrian. Now, two-thirds pedestrian, one-third traffic. And uh, it actually has become equally popular for, you know, relaxed, leisurely get-togethers and major demonstrations. This was the anti-terrorist demonstration in 2015, which brought together like four millions of people in Paris. And this is the follow-up project following on the success of the Place de République uh, transformation. In Paris, they are transforming now seven largest squares, uh, doubling up the quantity of uh, pedestrian areas, introducing some, um, some po points, of, po points of interest that will also like, connect people, and minimizing the, the traffic areas so that the accent uh, on these squares will be shifted from transport to connecting people. So just to wrap it up about the role of the architects, I want to quote uh, the architects Encore Heureux, who were the uh, curators of the French Pavilion this year, which runs like that. Those newly opened paths are fragile and precious. They call for courage, commitment, and the acceptance that what follows cannot be created without taking risks. But to do nothing is to take an even greater risk. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Please keep the mic uh, uh, at hand. You've shown us uh, 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 several examples of how architecture and architectural program or architectural routing, or uh, you called them uh, the, the, the socializing routes, can help people to interconnect and to or get the third out. places also. Or third places to get people out of their houses and to connect. But how much, at least because today is the architecture of connection, how much of that can you actually contribute to the architect designing? Or is it more the client asking for those spaces? Or is it, uh, I don't know, um, a policy in Paris, for example, to add uh, so much of public space or whatever? How much is actually an architectural tool? in these projects? Yeah, thank you for this question, because I think it's uh, very important to emphasize once again that I have selected specifically the projects that uh, maybe, maybe besides the ones which deal with the squares, which was, of course, the initiative of the Paris municipality, but the four squares I've shown here, they are run by, uh, by design collectives. So it's in consultation with the local uh, residents, with the future users, that those solutions are being developed. The two uh, third places I've been talking about, Hotel Pasteur and uh, the B6, have also been the absolute initiatives of the architects who came to the local municipality in Rennes, who contacted the building owner in Saint-Denis, to organize this, and it was actually the architect who embodied this initiative, who had this individual vision, which responded and which captured the desires and the visions of others. And this was the figure of the architect who helped to move this and make this happen. Of course, it would not have been possible without uh, cooperation with the local municipality, without the input of other people, or local residents, but 
uh, the role of the designer and of the architect with their vision is crucial. Uh, you men mentioned participation of the of the locals and the inhabitants already, but would you describe these projects more as top down or as bottom up? Uh, the two uh, the the um, the two I was talking about were definitely bottom up, because the, it was actually those architects who had the idea and who came to to, to those guys and proposed to make it happen. Uh, the reinventing Paris projects, uh, it's, uh, let's say, it's an opportunity given to those large design teams, but the way they respond is, is definitely their solution, because there were very different, there were different proposals, and the winning ones were the ones that, that won, actually. Thank you very much. Is there anybody from the audience that would like to ask a question? Hello. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't know if I understood you right when you told about this bottom-up. Mm -hmm. um, it sounded you said bottom-up because the designers or the architects mm -hmm. made up the idea. But maybe it's good to define then what is bottom-up because I thought, oh, then it's from citizens. But, but they, are, they, they are citizens. I, but they are, I the, mean, if we as a citizen, they thought of it or as an architect? Uh, I wouldn't uh, separate one from the others. But when, 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 when we say top-down, it's rather the public authorities, I think, that propose an idea to be implemented or makes it a situation possible. In this case, for instance, with um, uh, the uh, B6, it was an architect looking for a space to make an architectural installation for, for a big event, who found this empty office building and who knew quite a number of people friends and friends of friends who were looking for cheap places to deploy their creative studios. So he found a way to get to the owner of the building, to enter into those negotiations, to connect all of the people who needed those, uh, the, those, those workspaces and make this happen. I, I think it's definitely a top-down initiative. Top-down or bottom-up? Bottom-up, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. bottom-up. No, Thank you very bottom, much. I'm disoriented yeah, sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because um, as a designer, I often get the comment that uh, when you don't listen to the citizens, mm -hmm. but when you think as the designer, mm -hmm. you are not bottom up working. Mm -hmm. So in this case, it's a little bit mixed up because I'm always a citizen wherever mm -hmm. I go. Uh, everybody is a citizen. Sure. So um, then the difference is quite. Uh, balancing on how, how is the attitude of the designer, I think. I think the designer, I think the, the, the position of the designer is very both challenging, tricky and beneficial in terms that this is someone who is in the middle of different things happening. He's the connector. Yes, they are citizens, but maybe in a certain way with the vision and the possibilities they have, they are not like any other citizen because they can they can kind of connect the dots. And this is, this is something very important, very challenging. But you can do something no one else can do as a designer. I think, Anna, that we leave the definitions of bottom-up and top-down for a while, because after the, the Greek project and the Dutch project, we might have a, a whole different view on bottom-up and paradigm shift, and bottom actually. <laughs> Probably, <laughs> yeah. Uh, one more question from the audience, and then we move on to Greece. Yes, Hi, yes, I'm just wondering, out of the projects that were built, uh, quite a few of them were mm -hmm. uh, competitions, but I saw some of them were also built. Mm -hmm. um, most of them are built, there are just, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I mean, they are being built, the reinventing Paris are being built now. But um, I'm wondering, has there been an opportunity to, to go back and see if these architectural ideas actually resulted in the outcomes uh, the architects were seeking in terms of more mm. contact and connectivity between the residents? Let's say the Place de République, definitely yes. It has been there for a few years already and it definitely works. It's absolutely buzzing with people. Uh, it would be interesting to get a feedback from the Machu Picchu project, which seems to be successful, but it's interesting to see how many of those programs have been implemented about many of the other projects, which are definitely good ideas, but have to have this return of experience. We'll have to see. 
Thank you very much, Anna. We have to move on because otherwise we will be definitely in some kind of um, lack of time. Uh, I'd like to move on to Olga Ioannou, uh, principal of Ioannou Carvalho's architect from uh, Athens. And she will be talking about the Elionas project. Yeah, okay. which is actually uh, uh, a very interesting area where lots of, let's say, uh, well, uh, uh, to, to rephrase the definition of bottom-up, um, could be actually, it could be happening here, right? Olga, the floor is yours. Thank you. Nice to be here. Okay. Can you hear me? Right. Okay. I wrote everything down in fear that there won't be enough time. So um, I'll do both. Okay. So, my first encounter with the Leonas was during the shooting of the film. I should do this. Okay. Which was called Matriarchy. So, a very dear friend of mine had invited almost 60 women and our stories of suppression and abuse. So, the shelter, the studio shelter, uh, sorry, in that film we were supposedly gathered at a woman's shelter to protect it from being demolished. And the shelter was at the core of a Leonas. And while most scenes were shot inside, some of the filming involved actions that happened in the streets. Our, sorry, can you make the video play? That's okay, I can, I can proceed. <coughs> okay. Okay, so uh, the shelter, uh, okay. So, blah, 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 blah. Our long walk from the metro station to the studio shelter and then there was the protest against the bulldozers out in the streets and a night scene where agitated from the events of the protest the women sang and danced out in the street. So my first and only impression of Eleonas was that of the solitude best seen here. No, it doesn't go back. Whatever. Uh, so that feeling that whatever happened in Alonas was hidden from the rest of us um, and it felt like I was entering a danger zone. Um, I was completely unknown to me and also hostile. And um, there was this smell of dead animals all over the place and um, also the constant barking of packs of stray dogs that made strolling impossible in Alonas. Um, so uh, the filming lasted almost a week and after that, relief, I was free to go and to never return. And having said that, you can understand my initial O when uh, a year after my cinematic adventure, my two PhD supervisors uh, suggested that we should do a design, an urban design studio uh, and use Eleonas as a case study. So we go back a year after that adventure and we face this. I'm going to show you how Alonis works. So this is Athens. For those of you who have been to Athens, this is the commercial triangle. This is Syntagma Square, this is Omonia Square, and this is Ermu Street going down to the ancient cemetery of Keramiko. So we're talking central uh, Athens here. And this is uh, a street that's called Sacred Road, the Araudos, that led from Athens to Eleusina. And it's, it's a very high importance. So you can see Eleonas on the left side of the picture and you, even though you, I don't know if you're all architects, but I'm sure you can detect why Eleonas is so much different from the rest of Athens. Can you give me a couple of reasons? Do you see anything noticeable here? <coughs> yes, the left part. Yeah, all of it. It's a huge area. It's very close to the city center and it has a very strong contour. I can't show you the rest of it, but I'm sure you can follow the very strong line by the express motorways and the railway tracks of uh, the street back there. 
And you can also detect the difference in, in scale, right? So while here in Petralona and the Gala we have a very packed city, in Alona the density becomes uh, is bigger and the, the plots are quite irregular, right? Okay. So let's take a closer look to why this area could be isolated. There is isolation, of course, because of um, an indeterminacy of uses. So Eleonas for the past 120 years has changed uh, so many uses you can't even begin to imagine. This is Eleonas in 1853. Uh, it was the ancient olive orchard of Athens as seen from Acropolis and from Eleonas towards Acropolis. And this is Eleonas at the beginning of the 20th century. You can still see the uh, olive orchard on the upper side of the photo. And this is a, a slide that shows the development of Eleonas in, during the 20th century uh, from a completely agricultural landscape to uh, an industrialized one until the beginning of the 90s where the major companies left for the periphery, leaving uh, all warehouses and buildings uh, in Eleonas as they were. And this is the only thing that's left from the agricultural uh, history of Eleonas. This is the agricultural faculty of Athens that occupies a great big deal of that area. And there are vineries and uh, olive orchards and a lot of infrastructure related to agriculture. But then you have all these large buildings of uh, the uh, period of the industrialization, uh, low or medium scale industrialization. And now, in the later years, uh, the logistics companies, because of Leona's vicinity to the National uh, Road, many of the logistics companies have transferred there and occupy most of its uh, part. So um, you can see that you have a unique landscape where the natural element and the built element coexist in a way that's difficult to determine which one is predominant in Elonas. Okay, so we've talked about the isolation cost uh, caused by the physical boundaries. This is the national road, this is the railway tracks I was telling you about before. Uh, but we also have isolation caused by the morphology of the natural and the built elements in Eleonas. Okay, so um, most of the streets are crooked, there is no clear visibility, there is no direct connection even between twins of the same line. And um, despite their apparent vicinity, um, you know, uh, uh, different spots are quite apart. Most streets are impasses, and here you can see why. And um, we also have done a taxonomy of, of impasses according to their physical uh, properties, their characteristics, because there are too many of them, and they all have different qualities. And um, here you can see the morphology of the buildings and the high fencing system the, the industries had adopted. That makes it, you know, impenetrable to the human eye to see what's beyond that fence, usually. And despite the low density we've seen over the map, the Google map, you can see now that once you're in Elonis, it's the feeling is that it's compact, it's too, it's too packed. Okay, so there's also isolation caused by the complete lack of public spaces and the high pollution caused by the uh, in, uh, industry in the former years. This is the Prophet Daniel stream. It's a stream that crosses uh, the whole area and you can see its condition. Here you can see a typical street in Eleonas. This is Polycarpus Street. It's not even asphalted. There are no sidewalks. Okay, there are no lights or signs. And here you can see a, a comparison between Polycarpus Street that you just seen in the picture and Orfeo Street. It's the street uh, occupied mainly by the logistics companies where there's actually no pedestrians. There, there, is no, uh, there are no people walking up and down. And this is why. Yeah. Okay, enough of that. There is isolation actually caused by weak governments and bad management, right? There was this uh, presidential decree in 1995 that saw that Eleonas would become a big metropolitan park for Athens that was so needed for the city center. But uh, after something like 23 years, you can see that this plan has not been implemented. Uh, of course, most of uh, 
this this, this um, is owed to lack of funds. But as many times as um, you know, the the state has tried to actually intervene and do something, reappropriate parts of the land and give it to developers. Uh, the plans have stopped, and the crisis has left Eleonas with yet another half-finished concrete structure, derelict building, at the at the middle of nowhere. This was to, supposed to be a site. Uh, for the relocation of a major f Greek football team. I don't know if you know Panathinaikos. So, yeah, most probably you do. And uh, the plan was to relocate the stadium in Eleonas and create a big uh, park around the, the stadium. But then developers started getting greedy. This was supposed to be a mall. Citizens protested against the erection of the mall. And now it's completely stopped. So you've seen the space, but who are the people uh, actually living in a Leonis, huh? So you have the truck drivers, of course, and um, you have the agricultural students. You have many canteen owners, each, each one at each corner. You have some people, elderly people, who still live there because they have nowhere else to go. And you have something like 2,000 refugees relocated there about two years ago. I think it's 2,051 people, most of them children, who are actually outside playing in the streets. Do you remember that story about the stadium? It's the same site. The stadium never happened, but this is where they located uh, the temporary camp. You also have um, people with small vehicles, mostly gypsies and Roma people, with small vehicles doing the scrap trade. In fact, Eleonas has become uh, a big scrapyard. If you walk down Eleonas, you can see all sorts of different materials stacked around on both sides of the streets. And this is a property, you know, a property about you know, the isolation that um, you have a lot of informal uses suddenly because there are many people who benefit from that isolation and they actually are looking for it. They like being unnoticed, and their activities have to go unnoticed. So there is a series of informal, I wouldn't say illegal, but informal activities that are taking place. And in fact, this is the only instance where the Athenians and the Leonas actually meet. And this is the flea market. So before the crisis, there were something like 70 scavengers all over Attica. Now there are 700 registered scavengers. They also have to pay taxes after the crisis. So they have this flea market that's now happening in Eleonas. It used to happen along uh, Ermu Street, the one I've shown you earlier. But now they've been relocated there. Of course, there are no amenities. These people actually do this thing out in the streets, on the dusty streets of Eleonas. And, they, okay? and when, when it rains, they go into the derelict warehouses and they sell their goods there. Okay. Other than that, this is the image you get if you go there on Mondays, for example. So we've talked about Eleonas people, but who are Eleonas listeners? Okay, How can somebody make a, a reading or a meaning out of this indeterminacy, in that uncertainty? Hmm? And how do you tame it, especially when you have, just like I had, to, to, to do this field study with students. Hmm? So what we've done is that we've devised a series of workshops. And these workshops uh, uh, were done in collaboration with artists. And we started out with the Urban Emptiness Network, uh, and a sound artist, Gert Vermeer, in the middle. He's Belgian. A choreographer, Marilise Burgos. She's the lady sitting uh, on the office. And in the later years, we've added some more people, an actor and an architect whose research involves the embodied experience of the place. So our aim was to uh, immerse students, participants, uh, in the experience of the place and um, to use the human body as a vehicle for understanding the outside reality. OK, first workshop was about sound recordings. Uh, we used this platform, we, we met several times over the years, and we've used a digital platform, which is called Echoes, where we have uploaded all sound recordings made in the area and used an interactive map to show the location of these recordings 
and listen to one another, what you know, one another has recorded. Uh, there were also instances, can we play the sound here? Is it possible? It was, it was supposed to be audiovisual. Oh, frustrated. I spent, okay, no. Oh. Um, you know, students were very inspired by that because they, they started using the sound. Yeah, we do have a sound. Yeah, yeah, I can hear the birds. I think. Okay. All right. Uh, the students used the sounds to um, try to understand what they co uh, corresponded to, uh, different kinds of sounds, how, how hard they uh, sounded. This here, there were supposed to be videos of, you know, uh, visual impressions matched to the exact sound recordings they had made. And here we have the second part of the workshop, which were silent walks. It was a meditating walk where Marie-Lise led the way and everybody was supposed to uh, really concentrate on what he or she was uh, looking at and, you know, the, the, the surroundings and the, be part of it, immerse himself, herself into it. And then again, we have many representations of how students felt upon this. Here we had a video of a girl sh drawing with the sun, following the, the reflection of the sun on the muddy waters of the street. Okay. It's not as good as describing, but it should be better watching it. So the second workshop uh, involved an actor. We used this area, as you can see, nothing changes. Huh? These are different visits on different dates. Nothing changes. And here we've chosen an area where there, n there's there appear to be four streets, but there's actually just this one working. All the others are impasses. And it's beautiful because it has the natural and the build element as well. So the students had to perform a series of tasks. They were directed, orchestrated. Huh? Uh, originally, you can see the, the GIF here. They had to walk in line in constant distance from one another. Everybody could take the lead and redetermine the route of the team. Anyway, they, they, they followed different formations. And they started, um, you know, uh, re, uh, how to say this, reimagine themselves in this surrounding, okay, by really considering what they saw around them. This is a girl that's made a narration because she stood above uh, uh, many uh, cigarette packs. Huh? Yeah. And she started making scenarios about how they got there. And we also had a student who did this detective story about somebody who suddenly woke up to find himself lost in that particular site. And then, despite their initial awkwardness, students came up with many, many words that uh, described feelings. So these are the green words over there. Disturbance, disgust, isolation, insecurity, melancholy, surprise, peace. They started using these words to describe how they felt. Last and I'm closing with this, was a digital map, uh, data mapping. We used two uh, different uh, applications, Android Sensor and Gathered for iOS. And um, we could monitor body movement within the area, how many stops, at which points, how many time spent on these stops, the sound levels and the change of the orientation of the body. And you can see there, uh, the different lines of different participants in that workshop showing how uh, quickly or how slowly they walked around the area and how many stops they did. And here is a representation of the uh, levels of the sound mm, uh, down or fair street where the most tracks are. Okay. Last but not least, I'm closing with that, I'm not moving on to anything else, is the brain activity as registered through beta waves. They found out that high levels of beta waves cause high anxiety and down or first street you can only have high levels of beta waves of the third category over there which means um, absolutely uh, a very stressful environment. So uh, I've written down something I think it's nice to, to say that during the, the, the workshops we came, uh, we, we, we tried to help the students come closer to Elona's, but not just familiarize them with the area. We want them to, to facilitate a change in them. Okay? We wanted them to, to take a stand about this, to, to, to place themselves in this area, to, to reconfigure themselves because of Elona's. We wanted them to have a crush. Okay? 
and, and re redefine themselves, redetermine who they are and what they want to do, who they want to be as architects. So unveiling the hidden landscapes, we challenged the imaginary ones, okay? And the internal change that's not so necessary for someone to be able to design. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olga. <laughs> it, it, it's a wonderful project and very sensitive, isn't it? And, and uh, I really like the way you described first the isolation of the area, also in, 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 in um, uh, physical ways, and then how you approached it. But basically what you did actually is you taught your students how to deal with an architecture of either disconnection or how to reimagine something that came from or that, that, that could add to or contribute to uh, making connections uh, through sound, through uh, movements, uh, all sorts of emotions. Um, did they also come up with um, actual design solutions or did you not want them to? No, we did. It was uh, that was the purpose, but uh, we wanted to um, activate their sense of uh, designing for someone uh, you know who's already there, not just bringing new uses or super renderings of happy people lying on the grass. We wanted them to to, as I mentioned before, to take a stand about that situation and and be political about it. I mean, okay, what's the plan? What are we doing over the next few years? Do we tear down? Uh, the natural landscape? Do we try to uh, um, bring back a sense of uh, the natural element, but where people can actually go? Because right now there are lots of trees and there's a stream, but nobody, nobody can go. Yeah. So what do we want to do? Just create beautiful images of um, a life or a, a new life for Elonus, or adapt to whatever there, there is in Elonus? And you know. you see that the design interventions were different than they would have been, which is hypothetical, of course. It's then hypothetical, but yes, at a certain uh, extent, yes. We had students going out in the streets and talking to people, and when they came back, they actually made scenarios that regarded the people they met. Uh, they met, for example, agricultural students who had never been to Elonus because Elonus is their backyard. They go to school and then they, they never go back. So they, they have no idea of what's happening in, behind their back. So when once they, they realize that you know the students go but have no idea of the rest of the, the uses or the people, they just open the, the back gates of the agricultural school and extend it, its um, uh, facilities on, on the outer part of Elonas, so that people could yeah. If I may ask, if I may ask, so did you also find it that? that your students were saying, okay, I am, now I've noticed this, now I've done this, I will be a different architect. Oh, that's too hard to say. And these are young people, they're still, you know, developing. But um, some of them really took uh, a stand. We had a German Erasmus student who started teaching uh, the refugees' children how to skate. He was very actively involved in the area. Yeah, and we had other uh, students who, um, uh, went to the flea market and they tried to make um, connections of how to better the the way the the flea market takes place is realized right now is organized right now. So they, they actually did stuff on their own account, just you know for aloneness. In fact, the biggest change is in me. I mean, I've described you in, in the first place how I felt when I did the movie. I never wanted to go back, and now I practically live in aloneness for the past three years. I mean. You start to care, it's growing inside you, so. Thank yeah. you so much, Olga. I'm so, so sorry for all the, the, the videos not working, so but sorry, we will put them all online on the, the Packhouse website and on the A10 website. So uh, if you are interested, and I think you are, you can find them there from tomorrow morning onwards or something. Thank you, Olga. I'd like to move on to the next speaker, which is Stephanie Hoiplein, who's from the Goethe Institute in Prague. And um, you are actually the project manager of a, a project that connects 11 cities, isn't it? It's actually um, seven cities seven and cities. 11 institutions in six different countries. And the project is, share, is called Shared Cities Creative Momentum. Go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So thank you very much for inviting me to present this project here. 
as you mentioned, Havli, I'm speaking about a project from Central Eastern Europe and I'm living myself in Prague, but I'm German. So I don't feel that convenient to speak about the Central Eastern Europe perspective as I myself am German. Just to start with it, so how does it work? Yes, and to um, give you an impression how we understand the term sharing, I want to start with a trailer, and I hope it works. is around the idea of bringing people together and the idea that even a small action can bring big changes. Yes. So let me show you a map of the different cities which are included in this project. So as you can see, it's central southeastern Europe <laughs> as our partners are coming from Berlin down to Belgrade. So it's 11 different institutions seven cities, six countries. And what do we actually share when we talk about the topic of sharing? We talk about shared knowledge. So the idea to see what does work in one city and how can it be maybe transferred into another city. We talk about the sharing of urban space. As, yeah. And we talk about the shared governance, which is a big topic in Central Eastern Europe right now. And of course, um, you can see I guess you can guess so, that we also talk about the shared heritage and the shared history all the different cities have here. So um, there is this post-communist history and almost 30 years now since, since the change of the political system in 1989. That means that there's actually almost 30 years, one generation now growing up, one generation becoming active in politics one generation active in this project, so all of our partners are between 30 and 40 something, more or less. And it's interesting to see that they have a different view on the ideas of sharing, as you can imagine that their parents were forced to sharing, forced to sharing out of necessity, and that the, the idea of sharing, which is quite, let's say, popular in the Western part of Europe right now, is differently um, tackled in the central eastern part of Europe. So there is like the challenge to talk about that. But I want to give you a definition how we understand it, which is stolen by Duncan McLaren. So sharing means understanding cities in themselves as shared entities with shared public services, shared infrastructural resources, and shared spaces. But we still go further in seeing not only a right to the city and to the urban commons, but also a right to remake them. So that's the basic idea standing behind that. The project is running, uh, started in June 2016, will still run till February 2020. The center, the creative center of the project is Prague, where the Cultural institution from Germany, the Goethe Institute, the cultural institution of the Czech Republic, the Czech centers, and also Recite form the core team of the project. I don't know whether you know the Recite conference. It's an urban conference taking place in Prague annually, and it just took place last week. So I don't know if somebody 
just comes back from Prague to the Netherlands. And all the other partners, I won't name them all, as you can see them on the list, um, are coming from different levels. So for example, we have a publishing house, Respublika, from Warsaw and the consortium. We have several NGOs, for example, the, um, let's pick out one, Mindspace or the Hungarian Contemporary Architecture Center. That's like two different NGOs in Budapest. Or we do have also like a university in the consortium, which is the Academy of Fine Arts and Design in Bratislava. And to give you a better understanding, I want to pick out two projects as examples. So one example I picked out is from our partner from Belgrade. It's the Association of Belgrade Architects. They are organizing the annual BINA Festival. BINA is the Belgrade International Architecture Week. And the pictures you're seeing here are coming from their case study, Chuvari Parka. So what they did, they actually published the call to looking for initiatives who want to change something in the city. And the Chuvari Parka, it's Serbian for park keepers. The park keepers initiatives is actually a group of young mothers who saw the need that they don't have a really, they don't have a public space they can use to wear together, where to have the, um, their children being playing. So they decided to activate the neighborhood to start, first of all, to clean the space and to organize regularly cleaning events, <laughs> so to keep it clean. And then they started to um, have the design approach to color these, these center of the plateau, the space is called plateau, and to have actually a table installed there to bring people together and to have it as a community table. And I know that it doesn't sound that big, but having been there and seeing how the people are reacting to that and how the, especially the children, are really keen on these activities, it does make a big change for them. The second example which was with which I will finish is from Bratislava in Slovakia. Our partner there is the Alianza Stara Trishnica. It's the Old Market Hall Alliance. And they have do, been doing a case study around the Namesti SNP. It's a central spot in Bratislava. Um, it's called the Place of the Slovakian Uprising. So it's a really central spot, but nonetheless, it was not really used in the last years as it was in a really bad condition. So what they have been doing is that they organize participatory workshops with different groups. So they actually had workshops where they invited elderly people, workshops with young people, <laughs> workshops with a group of blind people, and trying to find out what their needs are to develop the, to find a new solution for this central space in Bratislava, which you might have known um, in the media, maybe, as there has been a lot of demonstrations in Bratislava in the last month. Like, everybody has heard about it, amazing. <laughs> no, there was the case in Bratislava that there were like two journalists being killed. And due to that, there have been immense of demonstrations and these demonstrations actually took place at this Namiesti and SNP. And so the outcome of the case study our partner did is actually making a plan how to develop this place further. So what would be needed to make it accessible to the people, to make it usable? That means what would be needed to make, um, to make it an attractive place actually to be there. And now the stage is that, that they developed this plan, they handed it on to the mayor. So the mayor is quite interested in that. But as there are going to be elections in October this year, the question is what will be realized and how it will go on. But of course, we hope the best that they can realize some of their ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie.
Thank you. So uh, while the evening is evolving, we get different categories of architecture, of architects' involvement, let's say, in, on how to connect to connectedness. If we look at the first, the French example, we could say maybe it's a focus on design solutions. And then the Greek example is much more about architectural awareness solutions. And here maybe we can talk about uh, the, the activation of, of, of participants, actually, to become more aware of their own surroundings and their actual... Um, um, uh, uh, say they can have in it if they take the effort of sharing or finding one. So it's clearly the bottom-up approach. Very, that very bottom-up. Yeah, mm -hmm. but uh, as we are still uh, looking for the, from the, the architecture angle today, mm -hmm. uh, would this project have been different if it had not been coordinated by architects? Is there some specific way how they have been, let's say, or the participants have been activated to look at their cities or to how they were use the cities. That is a, an architect's point of view. So it's clearly the design approach which is special in this project and which haven't been there if it wouldn't have been done by architects. But I must say that in this project, and in this consortium of 11 partners, that they are not all architects. So that they are different... Um, different people coming together, so also soci sociologists, anthropologists, so that there are different perspectives, and I find this myself pretty useful. I myself, I studied science of theater, so I have a totally different background, but I think it's pretty useful actually to discuss it on the different perspectives. Thank you. Is there anybody from the audience who would like to ask a question? Because if not, I would like to continue with the, the last example from the Netherlands, which uh, within the, uh, the, the, uh, the perspectives we have just been kind of um, uh, mentioning could be the activation of, of networks, of social networks and healthcare networks, which is actually in the Netherlands. Peter van Asche, architect. Thank you. show you two projects about the architecture of connectivity which actually is a term I really like architecture should always be about connectivity in some way I think and while we are waiting for the presentation to show up I'll tell a little bit about myself I'm an architect bureau Sla is the studio and I'm an architect and mathematician so oh I saw something <laughs> Um, so I studied mathematics and architecture, um, and this is very helpful, not, um, this is, yeah, Acrobat Reader, free download from uh, Acrobat. Oh, this is okay, I can do, I can do this. Don't help me, okay. And the project is called Bloemkool Burenbond, which is a, Tongue breaker in Dutch, and um, I will not explain you the title. <laughs> mm, I'm housed in this, uh, my studio is in, in this beautiful building which will be demolished next year. And I'll show you three projects of four we did, just to give you an idea of the kind of guy I am and the, the, the kind of work. So this is a school building without teachers. I wanted to make a school building where you don't need teachers. Um, and a museum, the glass museum, a building actually not far from here, it's opposite uh, the, the science museum. Uh, it's, an, it's a workspace for, for inventors. Um, and the People's Pavilion in Eindhoven, which you might know, it's a, it's a building made entirely out of materials that we borrowed and gave back to everybody after two weeks. And nothing, and the, all the materials were unharmed. Okay, I'll tell you a little bit about, about the logic of living, because um, living is something that we all do, and for some reason, um, um, houses don't seem to uh, change so much. So you can imagine that that the way we lived in 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 now has to do with the, how the society is now, and society is always changing. So you would imagine that living also always uh, changes, and. Um, um, in the 50s, it would be clear, right? Either you belong to the left or, or to the right group, and, and distinctions were very clear. Or here, um, it means something to be part of this, and it means 
also something to be part of this. And this is, you can imagine, reflects immediately on, on the way you live. The house and your apartment would, would be an expression of um, your way of looking upon life, your way of being part of a society. And, and this is important. And um, after, you would imagine, after 500 years of, of knowing how to live, after 500 years of knowing what society is, you, we would be able to uh, to understand living and to understand what the perfect house and the per perfect apartment would be. Um, and as architects, we are guilty of all this. And then, for some reason, after 500 years, this is coming up in some place. And of course, I know there are also some kind of economics b behind all this and, and so on. But it still wonders me to understand, okay, why is this happening? People really want to live like this. Is this the collective dream we all have um, to be part of this um, and um, this area in in Amsterdam southeast you might know this is this was our modernistic modernist statement right this is how living was supposed to be there's no area in Holland so much thought through as this this area this is the best the most hours spent on thinking on the, this area and now only 40 years later, half of it, half of it is uh, demolished. So, um, and then I'll stop, a, a stop, um, stop talking about. Um, this is the Dutch a dream, right? This, if you can achieve this, then you're there. <laughs> you have your own front door, your own front garden, your own back garden, and your own house. So, so for some reason, being connected. The architecture of connection uh, turns out our dream, your own palace, is being the most individual you can imagine. And this is so you have your own front door, your own front garden, your own back garden, and it's all walled and has fences. And this is your your palace, right? So, and I'll show you two two examples very quickly about different approaches because now we notice. Designing a house is very simple. Designing an apartment or a house is very simple, but designing a community is very um, not simple, very difficult. And initiative starts. So these people, um, these people came to me. It's nine nine households, and they're artists. And they asked me, okay, okay, Peter, you're you're an architect. We are we are artists. We want to have this house of 160 square meters. 80 square meters house, 80 square meters uh, working space, and we want this garden of 1,000 square meters each, so 10,000 square meters, op, all of us, and we have no money. <laughs> but you are an architect, you can do this. Yeah, so you have to do this. So we started, and this is, it's interesting because this is in an area called Oosterwold, and Oosterwold is a, is an, is a very um, interesting master plan of MVRDV where the, there are no rules. There are only a few rules. So and the RDV said, okay, uh, um, back to the uh, initiative of the people who are actually going to build, so th they can decide. So there are only a few rules. You have to build a certain amount of land, uh, of house, of land, and so on. But you have to allow your neighbor access on your land to go to his own house, right? But for the rest, the shape is free, the form is free, anything is free. There is no sewage, there is no electricity, there is no nothing. You just deal with it yourself. There are no lamps on the, on the street. It's all your problem, but your initiative, so you can shape your own area. And we were the first ones to be, be there, so it was completely empty. We were like a, um, a land forgotten from God. And then we gave them, I will not go too much into detail, but we said, okay, if you want this and you have no money, then we will design your house and we will bi build your house, but it will be empty. It will be completely empty, 160 square meters, completely empty, and you do the rest. You design your own bedroom, your own living room, but we decide on the outside. So you can have seven doors and windows, this, your map, you can place them anywhere in the facade you want. <laughs> that's, that's your choice. But we we design. So as you can see, the, the facade is completely regular, but it's completely irregular. Uh, so, so it's all glass on one side, glass on the other side. And you could decide where your window would be on the millimeter exactly. And then, um, uh, so here they live, here they are. And they're a very big house. And this actually, I'm standing on their land, right? I'm standing on their back garden. So it is, it's, it is big. Um, and s some of them really freak out. They make fantastic houses. 
Um, and the interesting thing is I didn't design the inside, so they are all different. And so some houses are really bad. Some are really bad designs. And some of them are really good. So, so people, people um, so, some, some are so good I could never have designed them myself. So I'm a kind of bit, little bit uh, jealous of, uh, of what they did. I'm not going to go into detail. <laughs> so here you go. <laughs> I'll tell you later. <laughs> at the bar. Okay. Uh, actually, I did. I I didn't like the people at all who designed the best house. So that's also possible. <laughs> that also, non-friendly people can design good, design good, good, good houses. And here it is. So okay. Now I'm going to who cares? Which is the main focus of t tonight? Who cares? Is about Almere Haven. And actually, it's next door. So that's really two projects in Almere. Almere is the the place in in Holland where. Uh, urban experiments start and are so they say, and it's it's true. If it's possible possible in Almere, then it's possible anywhere. <laughs> um, they are on the front of housing experiments, and this is the first house in Almere Have you see here. Um, and it it started from so even the land for the non-Dutch people, even the land was made by people. So there was sea. Um, b before it all happened. So first they make the land, then they make a road, and then they start building houses. And these are the first people living in Almere, the, the cleric. Um, they bought the first house in Almere. I, they rented the first house because it was all housing, social housing. Um, and it's uh, Almere half here, close to Amsterdam. Um, so, and now we talk, we are, this is the 70s, so now we are 40 years later. And as, as you can imagine, these are all we're all happy families, well, happy families. So mom, dad, two kids. They all move into these houses who, who are designed and made for happy families. But all like the same age group, the same um, generation. So they all grow older, kids leave the house, kids leave the house, and then they grow older, and then dad dies, and mom's getting old, and suddenly she finds herself with the rest of Almere Haver in a position where her house is too big, her house is badly insulated, so it's a bad quality house. Um, she's lonely behind this front door, which she hardly opens because she needs this uh, scoot mobile to go to the shop, which is too far away. So, so the whole area is at once falling apart, mm. which is interesting because it's one generation city. There you go. So, which was originally meant to be a, a courtyard for sharing space and sharing the kids that could play there is all fenced the Dutch uh, um, a dream is a fence <laughs> so um, the 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 state architect Floris Alkemade said okay we, we have to do something with this this is not an Almere problem this is a national problem right people are getting more and more lonely um, People are getting older, and Holland is not supporting any elderly housing anymore. So you take care of yourself, or your son does this, or your daughter, or your f siblings. So, so he said, okay, we have to do something. Um, we have to find new uh, ways, new, new designs for living, basically, and where uh, taking care of each other is is in the system, is in the urban plan, is not. Uh, um, done from above. Okay, I'm not going to. And so, so I start. So, like every 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 um, uh, designer do, I start with a diagram of life. Um, so life is easy. You born is on the left side, and you die on the right side. <laughs> it's the most simple diagram of life you can imagine. But it's interesting because most most part of your life, you you can deal. You can you have um, direction regie. It's a direction, the direction of you can decide. Most part of your life you can decide. So if I need help, I go to a doctor. If I need help, I can call somebody. So I'm in charge of my life. There will be a point in my life and in your life too where you are not in charge anymore. You will die. And this dying process is a very nasty, non-pleasant process where, um, where you lose control, right? I'm in control now, I lose control. And in the middle of these two, of these two pe pe periods in your life, there is this there is this sort of shift from having control to having no control anymore, and th this is interesting. So we focus on people that start worrying about having no control anymore. So they worry about worries. They worry about um, worry about 
not being able later. So I, I was still, my mother, she is uh, 76 years old, she's completely healthy mentally, physically, but she starts worrying about what will happen in five years, what will happen in 10 years. At some point you will lose control. But now she can decide. So we made this very simple process of how to take care of your life while still possible and, and managing the fact that, that you can extend this period of being in control. And first of this is that, that you have networks, and these n networks already exist. There are networks not of people who are sick and uh, sick and in wheelchairs, no. Networks of people who share interest. Like, so, so in my case, I'm interested in early Baroque Italian operas, right? And I have friends who are also interested in early Italian Baroque operas. And I don't mind if he or she is in a wheelchair or not. I, I share some values, I don't share sicknesses. I, sh I share something positive. And um, uh, these networks uh, are also existing for people who need maybe a little bit of help. Um, okay, I'll not go into that. And then I thought, okay, let's, let's make some housing cooperation together, some shared interest. Okay, we, we will define our own space, a courtyard space. And maybe people want to, to uh, join us. So there are at least 12, in this case, households who also want to share uh, making our own living conditions. And we are we were looking for um, locations, for sites in Palmyra, and there are many, many, because this land is completely empty. So we found a lot. Of course, they had land land as nowhere else. So it's a very low density area. And there is some logic behind um, these locations where right? you should connect to, to the existing network, to the existing uh, um, urban tissue and so on. This is all very basic stuff, but um, you will understand. And um, what is interesting is that it originated from a book we wrote about old courtyard housing. It's a 400 year old um, housing system in Holland, which was, is called Hofjes. And you have probably, as a tourist, you have visited them for sure in Amsterdam. There's one that has two million visitors each year. Um, and we were looking for lessons in this 400 year popular courtyard housing. And we, we were trying to construct a more inclusive society, like Roosevelt did. And looking at uh, what's happening now in the United States, this, this sort of s statement from the very visionary President Roosevelt is a bit cynical. Okay, I'm rounding off here, so I'll not go into this. But these are the three elements that are essential for good living. You need somewhere to go to, you need some point to meet, and you need some good organization. So we made this courtyard housing, but of course di different. And then the old houses would go to the families, to new families, new life in the old houses. So this is what it looked, uh, looks like. And as you can see, um, we made two layouts. And as you can see, and of course, it's incredibly sustainable. Here it is. As you can see, people are very happy. <laughs> and now we are doing, um, and I will stop here. We, we are doing um, uh, actually feasibility study of, of realizing this. So we have a new location, and we are actually making next year 50 houses for people um, to live here while they still are in control of their lives and then they can lose control a little bit and help each other. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. <laughs> so this was really fast. So are there any questions? There must be questions. Who would like to ask something? You showed a beautiful diagram of uh, yeah getting or of the life diagram, uh, but I realized that uh, you setting there's one point that you don't have the control anymore, and that is related to age. But I think that is more like age is one of the parameters that is related to the vulnerability, and that is the reason why there's also younger people uh, having loneliness problems. So yeah, rather say maybe. Um, it is related to the vulnerability of people, kwetsbaarheid, instead of age, age yeah. being one of the parameters. Maybe. And, and I'm really happy that you're saying this because it turned out we were having uh, meetings 
in Almere Haven and talking about old people all the time are losing control. And it turns out that the most people who showed up were people with some kind of autistic um, difficulties. They are perfectly able to live their own lives, but they need some kind of a little bit of assistance. And people with non, niet aangeboren hersenafwijkingen. <laughs> Help me some money. <laughs> so, so uh, brain injuries. Uh, not not from uh, but by accidents. So and so th th that are people that also need need some kind of assistance. So so yes, losing control is not about age only. So, um, question. Um, so how in ha ha this is all related to Almere Haven. Is this typical for Holland or typical for cities or typical for for any city, any big city or? Almere Haven is not a very big city, I think, but how do you see that? So, yeah, so, so what we hope to, to achieve here is, is a model that can be laid out or done in more cities than this. So this is not related to Palmyra Haven only. And the interesting point comes now when you start organizing these people financially. So this actually turns out to be the biggest problem. You can all do this. So, so we went to the market to ask for money, right? We went to the housing corporation. They said, well, yeah, we can, money is no problem, we can give you money, but your house should be like this, and the, the, this that should be like this, so big, this would be better. So we make the houses, we decide who comes in, and then we said, no, no, but this, this whole story is about control, right? We are in control, so you can only pay for the houses, but you cannot decide how we, we will use them. People decide how to use them. And then we go to investors. They say, oh, you can have money, no problem, but we need 8% uh, 8% retail interest, investment. Yeah. <laughs> retail investment, yeah, retail investment, we need 8% back, I don't care whatever you build, so I thought, okay, that's stupid, that's also weird. So now we're actually organizing them in a housing corporation, it's called um, Wohngenossenschaft, Wohngenootschap, uh, uh, and it turns out to be the perfect model for this. So people pay 10% themselves, 20% we, we take from, from investors with only 4% interest and 70% is by normal mortgages. So this illustrates that it is not exactly typical. A mere example, you can do it in the whole of Netherlands. Actually, you can do it Anywhere. in the whole of Europe. And you should, yeah. One more question before I would like to uh, ask all the presenters to come to the stage. Oh, two questions. Yeah. Yes, uh, I think uh, this is a very interesting uh, project. I suppose that the area in Almira Haven where you have done this is uh, completely um, social housing or rented housing in any case. In many uh, areas like this, uh, corporations have uh, sold uh, parts of their uh, stock, uh, sometimes uh, a little bit, sometimes more than half. Um, it creates, of course, uh, a mix, but it makes a project like this maybe also more difficult? How do you uh, look at uh, something like this in a place where uh, the ownership is not uh, um, is, is divided? So, so Almere Haven, it's, it used to be a lot social housing, all owned by, by housing corporations. They sold some of, of it, but not so much. And also because people are not so much interested in buying these houses. So, so people stay there. They pay like 400 euros rent for this whole house. So they are not moving out. Uh, it, uh, mixture, I think, would only help us to to do this. Uh. Yeah, I had a question. So the first project you showed was there was already a community that actually came to you to build a house. And how does it work in the last project? Because maybe I, under I didn't understand it, but did you go and ask people in the neighborhood, like, do you want to live there? Yes, and we then did. okay, and then it's for the same price. So we asked people in the, in the neighborhood, and we asked a few a few um, sort of le leading leading persons in the neighborhood. So they had this big network, and also persons of care institutions. Also, do you know people who would be interested in in this, knowing that they would need some kind of care? And then we had this one meeting. We sort of organized an afternoon, Saturday afternoon, had some coffee and tea, and then. And then the auditorium was full, full of people. So there is, so I could sell five of these uh, of these housing projects. But 
vinden vanuit de Bloemkoolwijk. Ja, yeah, Bloemkoolwijk. And uh, it's not a so solution for that. It's a solution for the people living in these houses, getting too, too old or needing help, and there's none. Uh, but of course, uh, having an auditorium full of people is not a community. A community has to has to has to be shaped or has, has to shape itself, and that's a, that's still a long way. Yeah. The neighborhood and the yeah. process, and I design the process, yeah. Yeah. Okay. and then in the end, I design also some architecture. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Please uh, have a sit at the couch, and Olga. Anna and Stephanie, please also come to the couch. And then one needs to sit outside the couch. So one will be sort of disconnected, I'm afraid. <laughs> Unless you'd like to cuddle up, that's also okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for your four completely different uh, uh, insights on how architecture can connect uh, people or um, communities. Uh, I already mentioned the design solutions, the uh, architect's awareness, um, uh, the raising of awareness by uh, architecture students, uh, as well as the citizen awareness, and now we have how processes can, uh, and how networks can actually be um, uh, created to, to find new and more um, sustainable or life cycle sustainable kinds of housing. Um, so you've all sort of um, been giving a lot of so thought how to connect uh, people with architecture. What, what did you from the presentations from the others, and I would like to have an answer from all of you, um, that could add to your knowledge of how to connect people through architecture? I would like you all to give one example, because we are um, uh, making a, a manifesto today, and the, f the four I already mentioned will be on it, but I would like you to, to add one more based on what you heard today. And uh, it looks like uh, Olga already has an answer. Do you have a microphone? I think, I, I think people can hear me. Right? I'm, I'm not quite sure. OK, okay. I think um, yeah, the, the word is openness for me. That, that's the main tool. I mean, we, we have try to open write up. It down. And uh, openness was a key word to, to, to dealing with that complexity, because this was a highly complex area to work in and a contradictory one. I don't like to to use the word complex because it has always been complex for everybody, but it, what, from what I've shown you, I, I think you, you get a uh, better understanding. But, but, but that's a lesson you learned from your own project. What did you learn from either one of the other projects? Only one. Ah, the other project. Sorry, I didn't get that. Okay. Uh, cooperation. I mean, it's the Dutch word. I, I, I love this word. <laughs> I like your country because of that word. I mean, Pitt's, Pitt's uh, project is, is projects are very, very nice, We're really, really inspiring. And this is something that we are very far from in Greece. I mean, we, ha we haven't learned how to work together and we haven't learned how to work in terms of, you know, community. And this is something that all, that's always inspiring to hear. Yeah, yeah sure. Stephanie. So for me, it would clearly be the mixed generations, which but like Anna as well as Peter were talking about that. And I guess this is really a crucial thing to think about bringing people of different age together and to see their different perspectives and to make them actually help each other and support each other. Anna. Uh, to me, may I say two things? Uh, f first uh, was uh, Olga's story. What was specifically important to me is this importance given to connecting to an experience. Like before connecting people, you have to connect to the problem. Uh, and another thing, very briefly, what impressed me was a very beautiful pattern which happened when you see all, uh, all, uh, all our presentations together. So the first presentation by Omer and Dorhan is about people connecting to themselves in a way. Uh, my presentation was probably about breaking down a big problem, like a, a bit of disconnecting to find solutions for different facets of this problem. Then Olga is about connecting to a problem in order to be able to live through this experience and find a, not an abstract but a concrete solution. Then Stephanie connecting different disciplines, different cities in order to share existing experience. And Petra kind of closing the cycle again on a different level about connecting people to themselves, actually 
each person to, to, to their own, you know, restoring their capacities of not even in control, of having their life in control. Wow. <laughs> Actually, this should have been the last remark of the evening because you wrapped it up perfectly. But I would still would like to know how Peter feels about it. And then maybe you have things to add. <coughs> so that would be the final round of this evening. Peter. So my lesson for this evening is, is uh, that I noticed that, that my, uh, my basic um, attitude in life that is, is that, that I'm kind of some kind of misanthrope, right? I don't like people in general. <laughs> and this is... Uh, so. As an architect, this is sometimes a bit of a... So sometimes I think, okay, leave me alone, just let me do my job. And then, But then what Olga uh, taught me s so well is if, if you want people to connect, you have to first connect yourself, right? So you cannot connect people if you are, if you are not connected. And what you showed us so beautifully is that how, how thoroughly, how deep you can go into this connecting and, and if even even performing a 180 degree shift in your attitude to this to this area and the same of course should happen with people you uh, from not liking people you should connect and then something beautiful will happen I'm sure. thank you is there someone from the audience who would like to add something maybe that you learn something you learned or that you would like to uh, to bring into the the the, the mix of uh, terms and lessons we already Collect it. Um, I'll probably be a bit unpopular for saying this, but uh, one thing that I, w in the presentations, which, uh, thank you, I really appreciated them, but one thing that really came across to me is that a purely design or architectural solution isn't the answer. <laughs> um, don't so trust so the architect no, would no, be the no, lesson. No, just that, um, so, uh, like, in October, there was the placemaking uh, week that was here and and they really reinforced that uh, you have design and you have grassroots so it has to come from the people who are living there and uh, the, the third one is that you have to have programming and that's more specifically about public spaces you can't just build a beautiful public space and expect that it will work so the programming is maybe a little bit different than this but it yeah that was what the the I think the projects that really connect the grassroots part with the design solution uh, and with a real idea about how is this actually going to work in the future, uh, I suspect that in 10 years from now, going back to some of these design projects, that's, that's what, uh, that will sort of determine the success. I don't know myself. I'm curious what, what you guys think. I'm going to write it down, but I need a little more time, but I will remember it and write it down later. But it, it comes down to don't rely on the architect alone. You have to also have the grassroots, the programming, and the process connected to it. Well, I think that's what the point we're all trying to make. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then it's also a matter of communication, maybe. Or maybe you brought it forth very good. It could also be. Yeah. But you agree. <laughs> good. Anybody else would like to add something? The uh, subject has been discussed uh, a lot lately, of course, is uh, that there have been all kinds of uh, experiments of how to uh, create cities and that uh, many people th now think, well, what you have to do is you have to use the right skill, you have to use uh, streets and you have to uh, make sure that uh, people can look into these streets and you have compact cities and, uh, you know, these kind of... Uh, uh, well, then you get maybe a lively uh, interconnectivity, not in, in a project or, or something, but in, in the city uh, as a whole. How, uh, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with these uh, discussions. How do your projects uh, relate to this uh, um, aspect? Question to everybody or to someone in well, specific? To, 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 to uh, well, uh, <laughs> Uh, who, who would like to address the question? Oh, I would like to ask, uh, especially to Olga. Yeah. To Olga. <laughs> Actually, I've shown you how the lack of public space influences the isolation, right? But the people living in Eleonas don't feel the same way as we do when we see Eleonas. So the, the, the children playing out in the street, they, they, they have rituals, everyday rituals there. You can find uh, along the stream, you can find small mats of people going there to pray. So um, 
what, what appears to be uh, irregular uh, for some people is their daily routine. And um, this is where it comes to you. It can't be a matter of um, imposing another reality on something that doesn't work uh, in our uh, you know, um, thinking. So it has to be about uh, understanding what's already there and working with that, okay? And sometimes what's, what appears to be regular is something which is very solid and very uh, um, important to the people uh, who are already there. I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah. Thank you so much. Ah. Just in time. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to make one very, um, well, just a couple of remarks around the fact. <laughs> no, no, yeah, just <laughs> hold it. later for the drinks outside. No, uh, just one on, uh, on loneliness and aloneness that are quite two different things. And actually, I think. I'm from uh, I'm from Italy myself, where actually aloneness is not accepted almost. Uh, but I've been living in Scandinavia for uh, quite some time, where aloneness has been transformed by the elephant in the room that almost nobody addressed uh, today, because I think we are mainly architects, which is technology. Uh, aloneness has been transformed into loneliness by the constant connectivity. And uh, this is one, one curious aspect uh, that I think uh, we didn't talk about technology at all uh, here, which I, which I think is playing a big role. And I wanted to quote uh, Herd Lofink, uh, that just, I think, a couple uh, a media theorist that was saying uh, that until 15 years ago, let's say, uh, the internet was the place you were going to escape from the physical reality. Now it has become the opposite. So no, now we, got, we, we go into the physical world to escape the internet almost. So potentially there is a lot, of, a, a lot, much, a lot more responsibility to architects now into making a connecting space really. But we need to learn much more how to how to engage with different levels of ownership especially i think with this explosion of the self that we have to accept you have you have been given this a lot of thought especially the technology part uh, how do you think because technology can also be a means to connect actually also within physical space or within public spaces so uh, what would what should i write down regarding technology You can tell me later, in the bar, yeah? Think about it, because that's interesting. Do you want to respond, any one of them, to, to the thoughts on the role of technology in everyday life and the distinction between aloneness and loneliness related to that? Well, I do agree that, that, this, that this makes the designer's work more important. So it becomes, it becomes very becomes a basic need having a physical shelter in whatever sense. So, so our responsibility as architects and designers increases instead of lowers. I agree with that. But that's the conclusion of every evening with an architecture, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Stephanie, Olga, Anna and Peter, one round of applause for them. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, uh, Elske and, and Julia, for, for uh, um, uh, coordinating the whole event. And thank you very much for, uh, for being here, for th thinking along, and for uh, taking the time that we took to, 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 to think about uh, connection in architecture. Thank you very much, and see you next time. Bye.